Okay. Good evening. Yeah, I had to wait for a sign before I could get started. <laughs> so, um, Ordina asked me to um, give a presentation on uh, Google Cloud Platform and uh, Kubernetes. So, my presentation will be split into two parts. First, uh, a quick overview of uh, what Google has on offer and what is the vision of Google in terms of uh, cloud platform where we are going and um, some of the strengths that make you that make that I would like to highlight and why you would uh, have to opt for a uh, Google cloud platform so let's get started so a bit about me um, so my name is Kuhn Maas and I'm uh, working as a Google Cloud Platform authorized trainer so uh, you can become a certified solution developer on Google Cloud Platform of data scientist and then to become that you have to uh, pass exams and we are uh, authorized to deliver the training specific to pass those certifications. So we do a number of public trainings. We have uh, in November, we still have two free trainings, introduction trainings on Google Cloud Platform in Brussels, in the Google office. So maybe I'll pass the information on so you can, you go, you can all join. Uh, we do also in-company trainings um, and uh, consulting on uh, Google Cloud pr uh, Platform um, projects. So far about me. So what is Google Cloud Platform? There are a number of big players in, uh, Google in the cloud uh, space. And Google is definitely one of them. Um, so, and they all provide systems to build, test, and uh, deploy application high on a high scale and secure and reliable. So your application can run on uh, a rack in the data center next to uh, Gmail, Search, YouTube. Um, and there are different types of uh, resources that are available, computing, storage, and then what uh, Google's strength is mostly at is uh, the big data and machine learning. Google was, without a doubt, one of the first companies that got confronted with big data and had to figure out solutions for that. So, And there are a number of application services, so you can buy, build about any type of um, application on top of Google Cloud Platform. So the basis uh, is their infrastructure, probably the, the most powerful infrastructure on the planet. They have the data center and they have the network between the data centers. And there they are unique. So they own the cable between the data centers. So if, if you have to route from one data center to another data center, you get milliseconds latency. You don't have to route over the public network to c talk to a data center in Singapore for, uh, to from the data center in Singapore to the data center in uh, Belgium, for instance. So they operate a number of data centers. They have uh, they own the backbone. They interconnect with the major ISPs throughout the world, and they have an edge caching network. And the edge caching network. Most ISPs in the world have some hardware running uh, that belongs to Google. They will see, ah, oh, this is Google traffic, route it immediately to the nearest Google data center. So if you're going to be building on top of a uh, Google Cloud Platform and you're hosting uh, some images, a user in Brazil will hop onto the Google network in the nearest data center and then go over the uh, backbone from Google, low latency, and it will be cached next for the next request closest to the end user. So that makes that the network is um, Google's uh, real power horse. Also, there uh, most of the products are built on top of the Google file system called Colossus, which is redundant. Uh, and replicates over multiple zones. It can do this so fast because they have their uh, uh, backbone, because they own the backbone. Only two months ago, they put a new 
uh, backbone through the, I don't know what sea it is, uh, from Japan to the US. So, and this is, thing, I think, concepts that you find for in with any of the other cloud providers as well. You have regions, and regions are really just geographical areas, and they form a combination of zones. And a zone is what we call a logical data center. There we know that Europe West 1B is Belgium, the data center here. But uh, in your code or in your manipulation, and well, while you work with Cloud Platform, you never see this. It's written somewhere in documentation. But Google wants to retain the freedom to change, to r redefine the link between the logical and the physical data center. So a zone is a physical data center. And if you want to build a solution that's really uh, high available, then you have to distribute your uh, resources over several zones because one zone could potentially go down. Potentially, it's a very rare case, but there could be issues in one zone, network issues maybe out of control of Google itself. Uh, so, um, distribute it over several zones. This is a bit about the strengths of the Google Cloud Platform. Still, we'll get into more technical stuff later on, don't worry. Um, there's a commitment to environmental responsibility. They are carbon neutral. They have the highest uh, efficient um, uh, data centers uh, at the moment. And there's their um, customer-friendly billing. So there's sub-hour billing which is also unique. Um, so when you spin up any uh, virtual machine, you get built for an offset of 10 minutes and then you get built per minute. Yeah, okay, I'm running my web server. Is that really that interesting? Because my web server, I'm running it, it's up and it's there. So what about that hour when I shut it finally down? But in the new world of cloud computing, servers are not there, sitting there, running all the time. They come up, they do their job, they disappear. You start up a Hadoop cluster, the job is finished, the Hadoop cluster spins down. And then it becomes important that you have per minute billing because that can really uh, make a huge uh, price difference. Sustained use discount something you also find with the other providers. Big difference is there's no um, reservation needed. So if you run your virtual machines and they run for 24 seven for a month, it automatically uh, get discounted 25%. And you don't have to say in advance, I will do this for a year. And uh, for the other providers, you have to say in advance, uh, this is for this long, and then you get your discount. Now your discount get automatically calculated as time goes by. And then there are the custom machine types. Um, before, when you pick the machine type, you had to say, I want eight gigabyte in combination with uh, four virtual cores. That was a combination you can get. Or uh, 12 cores and 12 gigabyte internal. So a high CPU instance and high MEM instance. Nowadays, on the when you create a virtual machine, there's some sliders and Google guarantees you that it will find for you a machine with those specs. So the sliders is not, of course, not the, the great innovation, but the, the guarantee that Google will go and find you in that data center a machine for your random um, specification is uh, is quite an innovation. So and it'll it allows you again to save money because you don't have to overpay for memory you don't need or overpay for CPU you don't need. Another thing we have is uh, what Amazon calls spot instances is preemptible instances preempt that will be killed every twenty four seven. Uh, at least once every day, 
uh, but can be killed at any time, but they come at a 30% price tag of a normal instance. Then, commitment to open APIs and open source is very, very important uh, for Google. So, Google does not want you to run on Google Cloud Platform because they got you locked in. No, but they want they open up their API and they just want to be technically the best. So, come to Google because they are better and cheaper, not because they got you locked in. So, examples of what they open source, TensorFlow is a, an open source product, Android b uh, running on Linux. The Go language, uh, Kubernetes, which we will be diving into deeper uh, in a minute. Another example is what's recently new is uh, the Cloud Dataflow API. If anybody heard about this, this is the next generation Hadoop. And not only is, has Google a, a commitment to open APIs and open source, they even changed their approach from what they used to do. Um, in 2004, I believe, they published the MapReduce white paper. And then a whole industry started up on Abdoop, Spark, and all building upon the white paper that Google released. But when Google released that white paper, they already moved on. That was their old stuff that they were sharing with the world, and they were already building the newer stuff. Now they completely changed their position in there, and now they're open sourcing while they're using the APIs and the, wi and the white papers. So they're immediately open sourcing TensorFlow. Kubernetes is built on their internal cluster management system, Borg. They're giving all their secret sauce away, but they also pretend that the best way to run Kubernetes is on their platform because they know best how to do this. Um, and then Cloud Dataflow, the next generation Hadoop, is the API is open sourced, the implementation not, but uh, Apache Beam, maybe you've heard about it. It's called Apache Beam because it's batch and stream, so we have Apache, Be Apache Beam. This is open sourced while Google has just developed this product and is using it still internal. So now they want to move along with the community, not run ahead and then giving back later on. The uh, idea has changed to we're moving forward together. So customers should use us because they love us, not because they are un unable to migrate away. That's the core idea. And then about the vision, I was uh, hearing the, the end of the previous talk where they were talking about serverless and is this the future? Well, definitely if you ask Google. Um, so what was the, the future of cloud computing? The first wave was uh, people putting their servers together at co-location space sharing, doing a little bit of economy of scale by sharing uh, the, the cooling, sharing the backup generator, sharing the electricity, security, etc. But the data was still owned by the company itself. They still had that capital expense up front. Um, the second wave is where we are at now, virtualized data centers. So, software-defined networking. So, you're going uh, to a console or you're using the command line and you say, create me an instance and put it in zone A of B and uh, install some software on it, uh, put a load balancer in front of it, etc. So, that's the second wave, virtualized data centers. But the next wave will be serverless and fully elastic and global. So, here we are still, what I was saying, struggling with the high availability as a customer ourselves. So I'm gonna run Drupal servers, a high availability, so I need some in Europe West 1B and Europe West 1C zone, and I'm putting a load balancer in front of it, and I'm uh, thinking about uh, software that needs to be installed on my machines. That's the second wave, that's where we are at. Where we are going is the third wave, the global elastic cloud with services like 
Cloud data flow as an example. Cloud data flow is um, you don't, while well, if you spin up an Hadoop cluster, you still say, I want 10 machines in my cluster. In the, in the Apache Beam, you don't know. You pay for the processing power that was needed for that job. Um, BigQuery is a good example. Anybody ever touched BigQuery or seen BigQuery? BigQuery is uh, their um, high scale, uh, fast um, analytics tool where they can process petabytes of, sec of uh, data and still return answers in minutes. So you can uh, do a regular expression match on all the Wikipedia commits ever with three uh, wildcards in it and still get a re response in 10 seconds. So that's BigQuery. Definitely my first idea was to talk about BigQuery, but they asked me to do Kubernetes. So it will be Kubernetes after this. <laughs> um, so cloud data flow, um, BigQuery, and yeah, but not everybody can shift along. So there's also the fact that Eric Schmidt said in 2008, Google started with Cloud Platform. They brought out App Engine, and they were wondering why they are, were not highly successful with it. And then four years later, they came to, to the conclusion that they were running 100 meter in front, and then nobody was following. So they came back, and they came back to virtual machines uh, and then helping the the and the customers get along kubernetes as the ideal solution to lift and shift and then the idea is first we're gonna change where the compute where our customers are computing so bringing them on to the cloud platform more scale more reliable and when they are well and good set we'll teach the customers a new way how to compute, which is with the third wave of the global elastic cloud with the third wave products. So this is a bit about the vision that's uh, out there with Google. This is something uh, I'm not going to talk too long about because I think that's known to everybody. So if I'm talking about virtualized data centers, I'm talking about infrastructure as a service. Big difference is there, you pay for what you allocate. So I want a disk of 200 gigabytes, I pay a disk of 200 gigabytes. I want eight cores, I want 12 gigabytes of internal memory, I pay this. I have full control, I can run about anything I can run on my on-premise data center, but there's a lot more DevOps work that you need to do there. The other end is platform as a service where you just care about your code. Um, for example, Snapchat, they started out on uh, App Engine and they scaled to a million of millions of users on App Engine with just a team of seven developers. Because you only have to upload your code, scaling everything taken care about uh, for you. So App Engine, very popular and that's where Google started out, but that's good for greenfield applications. If the customer already is running a Drupal or a Magento or whatever, it's not an option to shift to and to rewrite everything and to start out on App Engine. You have to move from this side and make it more declarative slowly and make it more uh, less DevOps, we are moving to no ops world. That's actually the core ID. So let's say four or five years ago, four years ago, there was just App Engine, a little bit Compute Engine, uh, BigQuery, which was one of the long time products that Google had. Um, and over the last two years only, they're scaled up from a, about 10 products and services. Now we're at 35 products and services, I believe. So it's really moving fast, fast, fast. Um, and we can divide them uh, in 
different uh, usage, compute, storage, big data, and machine learning. So in the compute world, the App Engine is the pure platform solution, Compute Engine the pure infrastructure solution. And somewhere in between there's a de declarative thing where our data center becomes our computer, which is called Container Engine. But there are many other solutions in between. This, these are just the, the main solutions. We have Bigtable, which also originated from the white paper on Hadoop and the Google file system. Um, which is a distributed global hash map, cloud storage, Amazon S3 compatible, and the same functionality, cloud SQL, cloud data store, a NoSQL database. And then in the big data world, they have a lot of products. BigQuery, uh, PubSub, which is uh, comparable to Apache Kafka, if anybody used to work with it. So, um, um, Publish subscriber system, data flow, the next generation uh, Hadoop, and data proc to migrate your existing Hadoop, Spark, ML. Uh, I have to turn it off, sorry. So, um, this is to migrate your existing uh, Hadoop and Spark jobs. Uh, to uh, the Google Cloud Data Lab, which is IPython now notebooks, which is for uh, data scientists. And then in the machine learning world, we have uh, the Vision API, Speech and Translate API, which are what we call pre-trained models. Pre uh, so, and they were trained with TensorFlow, and they're running on Google Cloud ML. And Google Cloud ML allows you to train your own models and. Uh, publish them as an API as well. So that's uh, the idea of CloudML. CloudML only left private alpha uh, one or two weeks ago. There's, by the way, a Belgian company which is partner of the year for Google, which does amazing things with this product. Um, OK, so I said, first I'm giving you an introduction. What is a Google Cloud Platform? I think more, most people will have worked with, uh, who has worked on Amazon? Okay, so, and who has worked on Google Cloud Platform? Okay, some. Mm -hmm. We're still in a minority, we have to change that. <laughs> so there was an introduction on Google Cloud Platform, now, um, Let's talk a bit about Container Engine. Okay, I have to give credit to uh, the sales engineer from Amsterdam who put this together and who was presenting this on uh, GCP Next Amsterdam in June. And uh, it was so nice to pass me those slides on. Um, although it was only presented in June, it was all the latest features were in there and uh, we are early October and had a hell of a time updating because there was so much change, so it's really fast moving. Uh, Kubernetes, whose work does anybody have a project running with Kubernetes these days? Okay, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, a bit of history. Um, first, maybe uh, who knows about Docker? <laughs> Who not does know? Who does not know about Docker? Maybe okay. Everybody knows about Docker. <laughs> Easier to ask a question the other way around. <laughs> but anyway, nevertheless, a little bit of uh, history: how how it went about at Google. So uh, they had first. What were they doing? Yeah, they also had their data center 2002. Google was, uh, how, what was, they were four years old, so it's still in their infancy. And uh, they had 
application specific machine pools that's how they solved it so they had their bunch of machines doing search and another bunch of machines doing other stuff um inefficient because uh, not every machine was uh, exploited to the t all the resources all the time um so they moved away from that and they started they moved away to shared machines so they were going to run multiple applications hybrid different applications running on the same machines so they started using uh, change route, U limits, nice, so no, uh, to prevent noisy neighbors. Noisy neighbors being somebody, uh, a badly written uh, piece of software, eating all your resources and everything. So difficult to share and at scale, efficiency hurts just a lot harder than when you're. Uh, in, uh, when you still know what's going on. So you have to abstract away from it. So share harder and good fences make good neighbors. Then Google in 2006, they developed C groups and the original, original name of C groups was containers. But they conflicted somewhere else. That word was already used in the Linux con uh, world so they uh, renamed it to control groups c groups inescapable resource isolation and better sharing and that's actually the technology that docker is built up docker docker popularized all the existing tooling that was already there uh, provided us with a nice uh, format to define our containers, the Docker file, where you can start from a different Docker file, etc. That's the that's how it really got mainstream to use containers. But at Google, they do they started in 2006, and everything is isolation. So Docker came out, the, everything. Uh, became popular and now Google uh, one uh, Google had that problem already how do we move our services around etc so um, now they are sharing their experiences back so they've been there too first yeah maybe you can already do a nice separation of your different systems but there's more to it, to running large-scale uh, applications. And there's just one piece of the puzzle that's now solved. If you can separate, have a clear separation on one machine, we need more. So there was still tight packaging. You had uh, uh, software uh, deployed on uh, specific machines you just still knew which machine your applications were running on so there's no way to move forward like this so what was going on um, we were still thinking about machine one machine two machine three and we knew which service was running where and also what machine uh, was uh, available, etc. So our machines were still pets. And does anybody know the story about the pets and the cattle? Yeah. So our machines still have names. Who's working at a company where the machines have fancy names like Titan, Apollo? Uh, I think that's very recognizable. Eh? So if you if if at the company you're working they still know I uh, get something from the G drive on Titan, then they're still in the in the pets world. So in the pets world you know your machine, you know what's installed on that ma machine, you cuddle that machine, and if that machine dies you're very sad because yeah, and you just don't replace it like that. You just you want to know. Uh, you're, you have an affection and you know about the machine, so your machines are still uh, pets. So, here 
we're introducing Kubernetes and what is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a way to th stop thinking about machine and to start thinking about the applications, the services you want to run. Because that's really what you care about. You don't care about that big server. You're sad because if the server dies, your, your, uh, your application dies along with it. You have to separate both. So internal, Google had a, a container management system, still have, which is called Borg. And they've been running that for over 10 years. And all the best practices from Borg, they have been put into um, Kubernetes. And Kubernetes provides uh, a logical layer above all your servers where your services can talk to and they don't have to know about the inv individual machines below it anymore. It supports multiple cloud and bare metal environments so you can run it on Azure, Amazon. There was a, a Dutch colleague uh, from Q42 who built a Kubernetes cluster on the Raspberry Pi, seven Raspberry Pis with some LED lights on it which was a very nice demo. Um, you can even have it a uh, hybrid cloud, so you can have it on-premise running and then you can scale out to multiple public cloud providers. 100% open source, we know about the commitment to open source and uh, written in Go. And the, the Shepardman is now Cloud Native Computing Foundation, so it's out of Google hands. They transferred the leadership of the project to uh, a foundation. So, thing is that there's no vendor lock-in. So, what are the core principles? Coupling is bad. Um, so, portability, so lock-in is for best for business. Come to us because you love us, not because we got you uh, um, locked in. Open beats close, so we're Google wants to move along with the uh, open source community and the velocity is really incredibly fast on this project. And then declarative beats imperative and you see this also during the different updates of uh, Kubernetes that more and more becomes declarative. Um, so don't think about actual implementations, that's for uh, the Kubernetes layer or the Kubernetes admin to provide. So um, we don't say provide us an Amazon disk on this system, provide us a disk and then the Kubernetes admin has to make sure that disks can be provisioned. Um, provide us a load balancer, but what load balancer depends on your physical environment, where is Kubernetes running. Um, very modular and so you start focusing on your applications you don't care about um, the physical machines anymore at all so it changed now we're thinking about logical infrastructure middleware backend and here underneath we have a a, a declared a, a logical layer that abstracts away our machines under it. And our machines under it, you can have five virtual machines under it, or then 10. And if one machine dies, we don't care. Machines don't have names anymore. Machines have numbers. So machines have become cattle. And if you have cattle, you have a cows running out there, and one cow, cow, dies, you re cow dies, you replace that cow and you give it a new number, but you don't nurture it, you're not emotionally involved with uh, one of your cows. While as your pets, that was a different thing. So underneath we have our machines and this is where the data center becomes our computer. So you know the t-shirts, my other computer is a data center. That's because we have an abstract layer and underneath is our computing power, our uh, storage, our network. And um, 
we don't have to know what's installed on the physical machine anymore. We are an isolated application that we can just dump onto uh, Kubernetes. So everything at Google is a container, has been a container for a long time. They start up over 2 billion containers a week and this slide is a year old so it might not be surprised that this has already become a lot more so 7,000 containers a second during this talk they start up 3 million containers so the just to, to give you an idea of the scale at which Google is uh, deploying uh, this that's also the power of BigQuery, which I was not going to talk about, where <laughs> the B3 is immediately provisioned with physical machines in seconds, I milliseconds, to execute your queries. So also that is running on containers. Okay, so workload portability. You can have that Docker machine, you're developing the application, it runs on your local machine, you can just push it to production, uh, you can push it to another cloud provider, you can run it on-premise. Um, and every cloud provider specific detail is abstracted away. So that's what I was saying. Uh, I want storage. You ask it to the Kubernetes API, give me storage for that for those containers that are running and the cloud provider will give you those uh, uh, that storage or give you ingress which is uh, hooking up um, uh, load balancing between uh, services persistent volume so everything nothing in the Kubernetes API refers to Google Amazon uh, Azure or whatever uh, the one setting up Kubernetes uh, can uh, allow you to get disks that are retried once or that are uh, retried multiple times or whatever. Depends on what the, your Kubernetes setup uh, has to offer. If you have that uh, stack of uh, Raspberry Pi uh, Kubernetes, then yeah, there probably you won't be able to get a node balancer or a lot of uh, disks or anything. So depends on the environment, what the abstraction layer can provide to your actual services. And those are the things you really care about. So no vendor lock-in. I think I covered most of what is on here. So modular and replaceable. And the speed of Kubernetes is really very fast. Uh, this is from June, so then we were at uh, 1.2 was released in March, 1.3 was released in June, 1.4 is released uh, uh, two weeks ago. So it goes really fast. Uh, 5K commits a week. Um, so a lot of people hopping on, a lot of companies uh, that are part of it. So CoreOS, by the way, uh, Kubernetes is supposed to be uh, container technology agnostic as well. And CoreOS uh, has developed a competing standard for Docker, which is called uh, Rocket Containers, RKT, but we say Rocket, rocket Containers. So big names that are all hopped on board and the core concepts that we have is um, now we're getting a little bit more technical on and then i'll go on to a demo what we have pods replication controller service and labels there are many new other concepts as well but as a basis this still stands i think so what is a pod a pod is um, the literally it's actually uh, a, a herd of whales and because the whale is the logo of docker that makes sense so in a pot there are one or more docker containers usually one in my experience 
there used to be, but it's uh, the idea is that you can have multiple multiple closely tied Docker containers working together in one pod, but that was often used. The second container was often doing log shipping or other additional services for a main container. And since the Kubernetes API got more uh, extensive, a lot of those second uh, auxiliary pods tend to disappear because the service is already there. But the pod is actually the service that we care about. That's what we're going to deploy. A replication container is uh, declaratively saying, I want so many pods of that type with that image running, with those images running. And it will loop towards that desired state. So if there are, if you say I want two guestbook applications running, then it will uh, check, ah, oh, there's none, I'll boot, boot up three, if one gets killed, it boots up a new one. A pot is ephemeral, as we say, so you can't store anything in it. If the machine where it's running up on its dice, it gets moved, it's a new one uh, gets uh, spinned up, so it, you can't keep any state in that pot. So um, an ephemeral unit, replication controller, making sure that there are enough pods. Replication controllers are now a bit outdated already because we have replication sets and deployments, but I'll cover that later. A service is actually a, a stable endpoint where, you, let's say you have um, five Drupal servers deployed and you need to load balance them. The, the service keeps track of where are those pods and what IP addresses do they have open so I can um, load balance between them. I'm not gonna keep track of it on a piece of paper just to know where my pods are running. And then labels are just metadata, key value pairs. You just add in key value pairs wherever you want. So then you can perform actions on groups of pods. So you can have a lot of a replication controller scheduling up some pods with uh, label production. And then you can say, yeah, upgrade all my production servers to a new, a new version. Uh, move all my test servers to something else or whatever. So that's what labels is organ organizational mainly. So that's where, where they come in handy. Uh, so rolling updates, it's one of the most important features of uh, Kubernetes. So then you build all those Docker containers with that website or what, uh, whatever service in. And then how do I update this? So we have uh, rolling updates with zero downtime where uh, Kubernetes will take pods down one by one and bring new pods up one by one to replace the old version with the new version. And this is uh, new in 1.2, so already uh, from uh, earlier this year. Problem with rolling updates is a bit that it's an imperative action, meaning you execute the rolling update. And we want to move much more to declarative. And so declarative uh, is update as a service where you say, uh, I want to move from that state to another. And then I can repeat that and, and I can roll back that. Whereas if you do a rolling update, rolling back is another rolling update roll, uh, to the previous version. If your deployment is declarative defined, then you can roll back because that de deployment still exists as an object. Whereas if something imperative is something that happens at a certain point in time and ha leaves you no trace. So that's a bit the difference. So rolling updates. We have a replication controller which says I need three replicas of a, of a pod where my app is running in. Um, I have them running version one. So I'm doing a roll on, rolling update. I want version two to be rolled out. Version two, the replication controller uh, comes up. I'm replacing this replication controller with that replication controller. So 
it will bring up one pot, bring one pot down, bring up one pot down, bring one pot up, bring one pot down, and we have updated our application to a new version. This is what Kubernetes does with uh, rolling updates. New features as well are auto-scaling, so you can define how much CPU you need and uh, some other custom metrics that you like, and if there's not enough, it can scale up new pods. And also new is that we now can also auto-scale uh, the cluster itself, the machines under it. Of course, that won't work in on-premise data center if there are no nodes available, but if you're running on a public cloud provider, they always have machines enough to auto-scale. So again, you have the Kubernetes layer, but uh, the capabilities of that layer are defined where on on what hardware it's running so the capabilities the the layer is everywhere the same but the capabilities the responses to all the api calls can be different because an on-premise data center where all the computers are in use auto scale yeah it's not gonna ring uh dell to bring a new computer you know so Auto scaling uh, won't work there. Persistent storage. This is also new, as I already explained. Uh, those pods are ephemeral, so you cannot store anything on it. So how am I gonna going about if I wanna uh, store something on it? Um, there, you could use a global elastic service, which is my first choice. Probably you use cloud data store, the NoSQL or Cloud SQL, which is also uh, reliable, scalable and maintained by Google. You can do those services, but if you really need disk space, uh, you can use persistent uh, storage. Um, so again, depending on the capabilities of your Kubernetes layer, uh, what is possible uh, with persistent storage? And I got a little demo on persistent storage. Uh, so here's my a, a cloud project. I have uh, my container engine running. Is that readable? bit bit bigger right so uh, I have contain created a container the container has three has three uh, nodes running so you can see those nodes they are re actually they are just virtual machine instances also have a uh, Kubernetes dashboard running on top of it where you see some of the pods that I have running. Um, but now let's do something with persistent volume. Um, Is that readable? Yeah. Wait, I'll uh, bring it a bit higher. Maybe better. Okay, this is just to demo one of the newer capabilities in uh, uh, Kubernetes, and uh, that is uh, persistent volume pers provisioning. So. I'm gonna start the demo. So first of all, we need to do uh, a persistent volume claim. So we're gonna ask the Kubernetes layer uh, 
we're gonna create a claim which is uh, which will ask for disk space. So we're gonna create a claim. We're gonna say it's a persistent volume claim. Um, we're working in a namespace which is just sharding of uh, all your API calls within uh, Kubernetes. And we're gonna say storage class anything. And here we see also the platform neutrality of Kubernetes. These storage classes are not, Kubernetes is agnostic about what these storage classes are. It's just the underlying Kube administrator, uh, the Kubernetes administrator who can define those and that can be called then. So, and we can specify access mode, read, write once. So, one pod can at the same time write to that, uh, to that disk, basically. If it would be, uh, if our storage class, if our implementation of our persistent volume would be an NFS network, an NFS share behind it, then it could be that multiple pods can write at the same time and that, uh, and you call that storage class maybe NFS and then you say uh, read write, not read write once. So here I'm, I want a read write once uh, claim. I'm gonna push that claim to Kubernetes. So the claim is created and we can check So there it's provisioned and uh, the volume has a name and there's a label. Demo is provisioning. Let's see if it's completely ready. Yes, it's completely ready. So we asked for a 10 gigabyte uh, storage and it's now ready with read write once access. And we can see it, we do a G Cloud disks list. And here's the 10 gigabyte disk. And it's here, you can see it in, his, uh, in, its, in the generated name, PVC, that it's a uh, uh, persistent volage cl uh, volume claim. So now we're gonna create a pod. Uh, this pod is, uh, is gonna install just have one container in it, a Docker container, and that Docker container has BusyBox running, and uh, it starts off from the BusyBox image, and it's gonna write its host name onto the mounted volume, right? So that's all that's gonna happen. It's not a very useful pot. So um, let's get that pot up and running. Let's check. So the pot is running. So here's the pot. The pot is running and is ready. It's not, y not yet ready, so we have to wait for it to be running. Now it will be running already, I guess. So its status is running, eh? It goes from container create, container scheduled, container created, starting, running. So our our pot is running. Now we're gonna I'm gonna SSH into that pot, and let's have a look what's on that uh, persistent volume. So it's mounted under l uh, slash pv persistent volume. And I can uh, say echo uh, hello ordina into uh, slash pv slash my test dot txt. And I'm gonna ex. Oi. Yeah, that touchpad is way too sensitive. And I'm exiting it again. And we're gonna kill the pot but our persistent volume is gonna stay. So our pot is gone. So no more pot. The claim is still there. The disk is still there.
So we still see our disk here. And now we're going to create a second pot with uh, the same from the same YAML file. So it will get the same persistent volume claim uh, attached. It's going to write its host name again to the persistent volume. So we can SSH into it again. And we can and we can check what's on the disk. So our files are still there. So we have persistent volume. So persistent volumes is a service provided by the Kubernetes API layer. Like many other services, this is just an example of one of the services. Other services are ingress. Uh, networking, a lot of other services. So let me SSH out of that machine, delete our pot. And delete our claim, and this will also delete our disk. So there's nothing more there. So we have no more persistent volumes anymore and it's done. So now I can have a look and in G Cloud. Compute disks list. And that PVC disk is disappeared. So underneath you have the cloud provider agnostic layer and on Google Cloud Platform it's implemented with the persistent disks or you could have other implementations. On Amazon there will be other implementations on an on-premise Kubernetes there will be different implementations on how those disks are getting there. So the idea is your services run on a vendor independent abstraction layer which makes that all the machines together make up your computer your data center is your computer in that sense so that was a short demo on and I'm running already out of time I see okay so other new features are multi-zone clusters I'll quickly run through it because it's already six o'clock. Uh, Ingress, before we had uh, the services and you had to provide a load balancer and a load balancer was uh, the service, the cloud vendor specific and then th that was not easy. So Ingress replaces uh, a lot of uh, those uh, services with load balancers. Uh, secrets. The, you should not deploy your secrets along with your application like let's say uh, your uh, public private keys your private keys don't deploy them in your pods grab them from your container so an independent security admin can I insert them into the layer and your applications can grab them and they can grab them independently in your development environment to access the right services you can have some configuration in uh, your Kubernetes layer as well. So performance, so over 1,000 nodes, over 30,000 pods, 99% of the calls return in one second, 99% of the pods scheduled within five seconds. Um, so this is some of the tests that were run at Google. New stuff in 1.3, pet sets, uh, which is for long-term services, really. Cross-cluster, an easier getting started experience. Now in the last release, we also have jobs because we're also we're talking about web servers that keep on running, whereas sometimes you have batch jobs. How do I deal with that on a Kubernetes layer? Well, jobs make sure that at least five times the batch jobs gets completed. Otherwise, if they don't successfully complete, they get issued again. That's another uh, thing. Um, 
federated replica, replica sets, federated ingress, federated services, so cross uh, zone and cross provider, and a lot of dashboards improvements. Now, what is Google Container Engine? This is about the last thing that I'm going to say. That's actually managed Kubernetes, as I say. Setting up Kubernetes itself can be a daunting task, and you have to implement all those API calls. If you go to the Google Cloud Platform dashboard, you just say, I want a container, and I want so many nodes in it, a cluster with so many nodes in it, and your problem is solved, and all the API calls are implemented. So it's open. Um, you can find it on GitHub. There's a lot of open source uh, material you can find around it. And I'm going to quit the UI and say thank you here then. Uh, any questions? It was very clear, I think. <laughs> All right, thank you.